Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to start the next session. And this is by no other than Dr. Eli Paranini. And he shall be taking his GLT2 inhibitors and the kidney. Over to you, Dr. Eli. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues and guests. I hope you are all well and recovering from this uh, COVID-19 lockdown that's been quite difficult uh, here in Italy. Um, my task is to discuss the role of SGLT2 inhibitors in the nephroprotection. And I don't need to tell you that the presence of diabetes is an independent risk factor for mortality, end-stage renal disease, and cardiovascular mortality throughout the EGFR range as compared to people without diabetes. So, in that context, nephroprotection was first shown by the EMPEREG trial. These are the data looking at incident or worsening nephropathy in the arms that were treated by placebo or by the combined doses of empagliflozin. And this was a secondary or post-hoc analysis of the trial, but quite convincingly showing two things. First of all, that there was a 40% reduction in the uh, hazard ratio in the risk of incident um, nephropathy or worsening nephropathy in the treatment versus the placebo arm. So the effect size was large. And secondly, that the two Kaplan-Meier curves that you see on this graph began to diverge quite early, as was also the case with cardiovascular endpoints, maize, cardiovascular death, and total mortality. And after that, two other um, cardiovascular endpoint trials, CANVAS and DECLARE, also looked at nephroprotection and quite amazingly found the same reduction in the hazard ratio for progression of CKD, um, kidney disease, in CANVAS and DECLARE, despite the fact that the background, the baseline prevalence of the condition was quite low. And then finally, an ad hoc trial credence likewise showed that in patients that had been screened for the presence of nephropathy of CKD, use of canagliflozin in this case was associated with a 44% reduction, 34% uh, reduction in the um, uh, progression of nephropathy. So there is a complete consistency across these trials, whether these were primarily cardiovascular endpoint trials in patients at high risk for cardiovascular disease and diabetes, or whether this was, in the case of Credence, uh, patients with background nephropathy. Now, what, this is also, uh, what is also striking is that if you look at the protection that is offered in patients with DKD by the use of statins, this is a meta-analysis showing that there is across different trials and with a degree of dishomogeneity, there is a reduction in proteinuria in the top end of the um, slide and proteinuria at the bottom with the use of statins. However, the ability of statins to um, protect from um, progression of DKD, meaning the uh, deterioration of renal function as, as assessed by uh, the glomerular filtration rate or the estimated filtration rate, just wasn't there. And this shows the same uh, result with antihypertensive treatments, showing that lowering systolic blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury in patients with diabetes brought about a risk reduction of total mortality, cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, but no significant 
reduction in the relative risk of renal failure. So, a couple of things are striking about the use of STLT2 inhibitors and their ability to provide nephroprotection. Number one, the effect is large in terms of size and has been shown both in post hoc analysis of primarily cardiovascular endpoint trials, as well as one ad hoc trials, and there are more coming. And second, this is in populations where either antihypertensive agents or statins have not been able to show protection against progression of CKD in terms of loss of GFR. So the questions have naturally come up, what could possibly be the mechanisms for this SGLT2 inhibitor based nephroprotection? So SGLTs are located in the kidney and SGLT2, the isoform 2 of the SGLT is almost, so far as we know, is almost exclusively located in the proximal tubule in the segment one and two of the kidney. Uh, the one isoform, SGLT1, is also expressed in the renal tubule downstream to the SGLT2, as well as in the gut. But in terms of SGLT2, and so in relation of the use of SGLT2 specific inhibitors, the uh, expression is almost exclusively in the kidney. Sodium and glucose are co-transported from the lumen into the tubular cell and then extruded from the tubular cell back into the interstitium and eventually into the bloodstream by the operation of the sodium potassium pump. So, two concepts here. One, that there is joint co-transport of sodium and glucose in addition to other transport mechanisms through the SGLT1 and 2. And second, that the uh, um, recovery of glucose and sodium from the filtrate is operated by the sodium potassium pump, which is obviously a, uh, an energy driven mechanism. So, if one looks at renal glucose handling in patients with type 2 diabetes, for example, and across a range of filtered glucose and concomitant plasma glucose concentrations, you see what is expected from physiology textbooks, that there is almost complete reabsorption of glucose up until a plasma glucose concentration anywhere between 180 and 200 milligrams per deciliter, beyond which there begins to be excretion, which then becomes exponential. This is the renal threshold for glucose. But what has also been uh, appreciated recently is that this renal threshold for glucose reabsorption through the kidney in patients with type 2 diabetes is increased. These are data obtained in vivo with the use of the pancreatic clamp technique, raising the plasma glucose concentration into the uh, high 400 milligram per deciliter range in patients with well-controlled type 2 diabetes or in subjects with normal glucose tolerance, showing that for the same urine flow, creatinine clearance, and matched amounts of glucose being filtered through the glomerulus, glucose excretion, in particular the fractional glucose excretion, is significantly reduced or reabsorption of glucose, which is complementary to fractional glucose excretion, is specifically increased in patients with diabetes as compared to non-diabetic individuals, which means that this is a defect in the kidney of patients with diabetes, probably intrinsical to the diabetes itself, for all we know, which translates into an increased reabsorption of both glucose and sodium through the renal tubule, thereby contributing to the hyperglycemia on the one hand and the sodium retention on the other hand. We don't fully understand why that's the case, because the expression of SGLT2 
is not increased in patients with type 2 diabetes. So this is a functional abnormality. But whether this is acquired or genetically driven, whether it can be reversed by good glycemic control or other interventions, we do not know. But the fact is that consistently in humans, this increased reabsorption of glucose at the level of the renal tubule has been demonstrated beyond doubt. Now, when we give an SGLT2 inhibitor, what happens is that the renal threshold for glucose is shifted all the way to the left, such that at each plasma glucose concentration well into the euglycemic range and into actually the hypoglycemic range, there is glucose excretion shown by the uh, red full line here. And obviously, there is reduction in the complementary absorption of glucose. So the uh, uh, partial inhibition, which is in fractional terms in the order of about 40%, of this co-transport in the kidney results in a large leftward shift in the uh, glucose, uh, renal glucose threshold, whereby there is glucose excretion into the urine throughout the uh, range of plasma glucose concentrations. And the other important thing to remember is that this glycosuria is not just a trifle of glucose being lost into the urine because it averages anywhere between 60 and 120 grams a day. So it's massive glycosuria, something that is never seen except under conditions of diabetic ketoacidosis, where the excess glycosuria is obviously transient before treatment is instituted. So every day, the kidney of the diabetic on an SGLT2 inhibitor treatment is exposed to a large amount of glucose and sodium being um, lost from reabsorption uh, at the level of the proximal tubule. So one first consequence of this is that the amount of ATP that is needed to run the glucose potassium pump at the level of the basal lateral membrane of the uh, tubule in the kidney is reduced because a large amount of glucose and sodium escape reabsorption. And these are actual data. They are averaged from experiments carried out in vivo in patients with well-controlled type 2 diabetes and in subjects with normal glucose tolerance, showing that the fractional proximal sodium reabsorption also is increased in patients with type 2 diabetes. And consequently, the ATP consumption that is uh, fueling this process is also increased uh, to a calculated level of 0.58 moles a day as compared to 0.38 moles a day in patients with, in subjects with normal glucose tolerance. Now, when you come in with an SGLT2 inhibitor, in this case, it was empagliflozin, obviously there is a large increase in glucose excretion, 0.55 moles a day. There is an escape in fractional, fractional proximal sodium reabsorption, which drops to 3.6% from the 7.1% in the untreated condition, and consequently, there is a saving of about 0.34 moles a day of ATP from being used to fuel the reabsorption of sodium and glucose at the level of the proximal tubule. So there is some energy saving from letting glucose and sodium escape reabsorption proximately in the kidney. Now, is this helping the kidney? in terms of running at the high rate of energy demand that it runs every day. It's just one potential mechanism, but it's uh, quantifiable. Then the other consequence of blocking the reabsorption of glucose is that with glycosuria, there is also an increase in urine output. These data show results obtained in the fasting state and for five hours following a mixed meal at baseline 
then following the first administration of an SGLT2 inhibitor, which was empagliflozin in this case, and then after chronic administration of SGLT2 inhibition. And these are patients with uh, type 2 diabetes, again, well-controlled type 2 diabetes. And as you can see, urine output is increased because of the osmotic diuresis, particularly acutely, and it's then tempered over time, although it's been calculated in longer term experiments that urine output in, is increased chronically on the average by about 400 ml per day. So there is an increase in urine volume. This is probably one of the reasons leading to an intravascular volume contraction. These data are very well known, again, from the EMPAREC trial, show that early after starting treatment with empagliflozin, either dose 10 or 25 milligrams, there is an increase in the hematocrit, which is sustained throughout the almost four years of treatment. And what is not shown on the slide is that once treatment is interrupted, this volume contraction uh, is reversed. And one of the consequences at the level of the kidney is that initially there is a drop in GFR, which was initially a concern for people that were developing these SGLT2 inhibitors with the idea that they could be nephrotoxic. However, going on for longer periods of treatment, as shown again in the EMPAREC trial and confirmed in all the other STLT2 inhibitor trials, there is a stabilization of glomerular filtration rate in the treatment arms, whereas in the placebo arm, the GFR drops in patients with type 2 diabetes at the typical rate of about 2 ml per minute per year. So there is an initial reduction in GFR, which probably is related to the volume contraction, which then stabilizes and actually preserves renal function in terms of uh, preservation of GFR. And another possibility uh, of a mechanism is the fact that at the junction between the cortex and the medulla in the kidney, the uh, the uh, kidney runs on the, on the edge, on the bridge of um, ischemia because of the relatively low perfusion rate and relatively high oxygen demand. And with the small but consistent reduction, initial reduction in GFR, there could be a stimulus for the release of erythropoietin, which is uh, shown in this study and in subsequent studies that have confirmed this, is transiently increased in response early on in response to treatment with HGLT2 inhibitors. So an increase in erythropoietin is possibly then um, translating into an increased erythropoiesis thereby providing increased oxygen carrying capacity to the blood that perfuses the liver as well as uh, other organs. So on the one hand, you have an initial reduction in GFR, which translates into a reduction of intraglomerular pressure, the increase of which is a mechanism of renal injury. But on the other hand, it can uh, trigger early on during treatment the release of erythropoietin, thereby increasing the amount of hemoglobin being carried by the same volume of blood to the kidney as well as to other organs. So this is another potential renal-based mechanism of nephroprotection. And then, quite interestingly, it has been shown that uh, dabagliflozin in this case, but SGLT2 inhibitors in general, are not simply proximal diuretics. This is a study that compared the um, intravascular volume and the interstitial fluid volume in a matched studies in patients with type 2 diabetes treated with either dabagliflozin, a, a selective SGLT2 inhibitors, or a thiazide diuretic, 
showing a difference between the two. The difference being that with the diuretic, bumetanide in this case, there is a larger drop in intravascular volume which then stimulates the renal angiotensin aldosterone system, which counteracts the uh, uh, beneficial effects of direct treatment. And this is something that has been known for years. Whereas with hypogliflozin, there is a similar decrease in the extracellular interstitial fluid volume with less of a decrement in the intravascular volume. So this differential distribution of volume depletion between the intravascular volume and the interstitial fluid is probably responsible for the fact that there is no major increase in the activity of the renal angiotensin aldosterone system with SGLT2 inhibitors compared to diuretics. But at the same time, the effect, the anti-congestive effect of dapagliflozin is perfectly retained, just like uh, a diuretic. Then, because the SGLT are uh, co-transporters of sodium and glucose, there is also an increase, particularly acutely, again, this data in patients with type 2 diabetes, given the first ever pill of, um, in this case, empagliflozin, there is an increase both in the fasting state and following a meal in sodium excretion, which is then attenuated, but probably continues to go on at a very, very small rate, which is probably difficult to pick up in in vivo experiments, but it's there. And one of the consequences of this has been put into a new model of sodium and water, whereby sodium is distributed not only in the intravascular water and in the interstitial fluid, but also in a peripheral compartment, which is located in tissues and within tissues, which is still in exchange with the interstitial fluid and the intravascular volume, but at different rates than the interstitial fluid and the intravascular volume themselves. And so what may be happening is that with the mild but chronic loss, relative loss of sodium through the naturetic effect of SGLT2 inhibitors, peripheral tissues are progressively depleted of the sodium that has accumulated, for example, in vascular tissues, in the myocardium, and even in the skin, thereby reducing the sensitivity of the vasculature, for example, to vasoconstrictor stimuli, particularly catecholamine. This is a very interesting potential mechanism that needs to be consolidated and confirmed by experiments in vivo, but has um, been given some um, confirmation in studies that have looked using magnetic resonance spectroscopy that they have been able to measure sodium accumulation in peripheral tissues directly, showing that with SGLT2 inhibition, there may be this progressive um, depletion of intra-tissue sodium, which can only do good to end organs. And finally, there can be a purely metabolic mechanism. These are the plasma glucose concentration profiles in patients with type 2 diabetes, again, in the um, baseline condition in blue, and then following four weeks of treatment with an SGLT2 inhibitor, showing that both in the fasting condition and after a meal, there is the expected decrease in plasma glucose levels, which is simply due to the uh, dumping of glucose from the distribution space into the urine. And concomitantly, there is a reduction in the plasma insulin concentrations, which are primarily driven by plasma glucose levels under all circumstances. Now, we know for a fact that it's been documented over and over again that a reduction in circulating insulin derepresses lipolysis in adipose tissue, with the consequence that the triglycerides are broken down into free fatty acids and glycerol, 
which then are um, put back into the bloodstream where the concentration of free fatty acids is consequently increased. And in the study that I showed previously, particularly in the fasting state, but also in response to meal-induced suppression of free fatty acids, it can be appreciated that the levels are consistently above those of the baseline study after treatment with an SGLT2 inhibitor. So, so uh, lipolysis goes on at an increased rate. Now, this circulating free fat, this excess free fatty acid level in the bloodstream uh, fluxes to all organs, in the liver in particular, in the presence of a reduced insulin to glucagon ratio, this translates into a stimulation of ketogenesis. The reason being that following beta oxidation and provision of acetyl-CoA, there is only so much more acetyl-CoA that can be completely oxidized in an organ like the liver, which already runs on uh, oxidation of free fatty acids, and therefore ketogenesis is stimulated, and ketone bodies, principally beta-hydroxybutyrate, but also acetoacetate, are released into the circulation. And the important concept is that in the circulation, we can measure this increase, for example, in beta-hydroxybutyrate levels. The top panels showing in green the beta-hydroxybutyrate concentrations after four weeks of dosing with empagliflozin in patients with type 2 diabetes, the levels being increased on average by two or three times. But they, it also shows on the right-hand side that the same phenomenon is observed, although attenuated, in patients with normal glucose tolerance because the mechanism is exactly the same. And in the bottom panels, you see in a much longer study carried out by Dave Polidori, the uh, circulating levels, the increment in beta-hydroxybutyrate on the left and acetoacetate on the right, divided into quartiles of circulating levels following treatment with canagliflozin in patients with type 2 diabetes. So there is no question that the ketogenesis results in an increased output of ketone bodies from the liver, which cannot use, cannot oxidize ketones into the bloodstream being offered to the other organs in the body. And once in the bloodstream, ketones flux to the kidney, to the heart, and to the brain. All these three organs are endowed with SCOT, which is the uh, rate-limiting enzyme in ketolysis, in the breakdown of beta-hydroxybutyrate to acetoacetate and from that to acetyl-CoA, which can then feed the TCA cycle, provided that the anaplerosis has uh, made sufficient anaplerotic substrates available. So this uh, excess substrate generated via lipolysis and ketogenesis is then offered as a rescue uh, sort of substrate, not just to the heart, but also to the kidney and to the brain. Now, the specific problem with the kidney is that kidneys can not only utilize ketone bodies, but they can also make ketone bodies to a lesser extent than the liver, and they can excrete ketones. So to actually measure in vivo the, these three fluxes is quite complicated. But at any rate, we know that the kidney uses lots of free fatty acids in addition to glucose substrates such as lactate and in addition to glucose itself and glutamate, and the utilization of, of free fatty acids and possibly also of ketones is differential along the nephron, with free fatty acids dominating in the um, proximal uh, tubule and uh, other substrates uh, possibly being more important in the uh, following sections of the nephron. But I should say at this point that most of this knowledge that is summarized in this slide actually comes from 
in vitro studies of isolated kidney slices treated in vitro or uh, rodent experiments, animal experiments. The information in vivo is actually surprisingly scanty because of the difficulty that I mentioned to study kidney metabolism in vivo. However, recently we have had the possibility of using imaging techniques, for example, the combination of CAT scanning and magnetic resonance imaging, as was done in this recent study that I was fortunate enough to collaborate with, which can image the kidneys such that the actual volume of the organs can be measured. Then, with the use of positron emitting tomography combined with CAT scanning and the use of, um, eyes, uh, of um, uh, oxygen 15 in this case, one can measure in regions of interest of the cortex or the medulla of the kidney perfusion. And we know that the kidney under normal circumstances is a highly perfused organ, which absorbs about 20% of cardiac output, despite the fact that the total weight of the kidneys combined is on about 250 grams. So with this technique in combination with uh, um, MRI, we can actually measure the perfusion of different regions of the kidney, and finally, Using, for example, an analog of fatty acids, FTHA, we've been able to uh, detect the amount of free fatty acids that are taken up and oxidized in different regions of the kidney. And this slide just shows the preliminary results that we got looking at cortical on the left and medullary free fatty acid oxidation in human kidneys and showing that in both sections of the kidney, the uptake of free fatty acids is proportional to whole body fat oxidation, which simply means that the excess delivery of free fatty acids that is presented via the increased lipolysis is made available to all tissues in the body, including the kidney, and the kidney will take up free fatty acids in proportion to the delivery to the amount that is offered to the organ. Now, the further fate of these free fatty acids and the further metabolic modifications and changes within the kidney that result from the uh, increased lipolysis, ketogenesis, and free fatty acid delivery remain to be studied. And these are topics that are under active investigation. I thank you for your attention, and I will take your questions now. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Ali Ferranini. Uh, now I request Archana, you must have received a couple of questions from the audience since we have short yep. time. Uh, maybe yep. you, can, you can quickly ask one question of most relevant question. We just have time for one question. Yep. Sir, uh, in your personal experience, would you say there is a difference between each molecule or everything mm -hmm. that we have been talking about is entirely a class effect? Any personal preferences, experience, studies? Right. So, so far as we can tell, with the current state of knowledge, these are all class effects. And it's um, not been possible to identify any action within the SGLT2 inhibitor class that is differential between the different members of the class. Now, it should be said that in the case of canagliflozin, there is some in vivo evidence that it also engages SGLT1 co-transporters in the kidney and the gut, likewise. So um, it's been calculated that about 10% of the action of canagliflozin, particularly the top dose of 300 milligram, may be due to the engagement of SGLT1 co-transporters in the kidney and in the gut. But other than that, the sequence of events that I described, going from lower glucose and insulin, stimulation of lipolysis, 
acceleration of ketogenesis and increased availability of fatty substrates and ketones to all organs in the body is the same for the, um, uh, all the members of the SGLT2 class, whether or not they are um, selective for SGLT2 or they also engage to some extent SGLT1 co-transporters. Okay, one, one last quick question before we end the session. Uh, Dr. Ali Ferranini, if you are supposed to head a committee to write the guidelines, what will you bring on after metformin? An SGLT2 or a GLP-1? Ah, this is a very difficult question worth uh, another meeting. I think that the uh, pattern of beneficial and organ effects different between the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonist. And I think the weight of current evidence shows that for SGLT2 inhibitors, all members of the class, the main cardiovascular effect is very likely uh, heart failure and renal protection. Whereas in the case of the GLP-1 receptor agonist, the effect on mortality is less, probably it's delayed compared to the SGLT1 inhibitors, and possibly the effect is on atherogenesis or anyway atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease rather than uh, heart failure. Now, there is obviously an overlap because a lot of heart failure is the consequence of uh, ischemia or ischemic episodes. Uh, and so is linked with atherosclerosis nevertheless. Um, a lot of heart failure can also be linked with arrhythmia. And we don't quite know whether there is a differential effect of SGLT2 inhibitors yeah, and GLP-1 receptor. Yeah, on, 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 um, on arrhythmias. So I, I think that the choice between the two classes should be guided by, first of all, by the availability and the clinical experience and the clinical judgment of the physician, but also uh, awareness of this differential impact. The one side where they join is actually nephropathy, because nephropathy has uh, been shown to be protected by both classes of drugs. Thank you. And uh, with that, we thank Dr. Ali Faradini, Dr. Archana Sarda, my co-host here, and uh, we end this particular session now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank so you. Much.